So at the same time, we don't didn't want to lose sight of some significant developments, uh, both in the West Bank and in Gaza. We can put this up on the screen. What you are looking at here is a violent pogrom against Palestinians in the West Bank as Israeli soldiers stand by and watch. Um, this latest violence, which you saw a car set on fire, you're seeing um, you know, fire set on buildings, cars, all sorts of uh, civilian infrastructure here in the West Bank, farms attacked and, uh, and um, in the occupied West Bank as well. The source of this violence initially was a 14-year-old Israeli boy who was found dead. Settlers uh, blamed that death on Palestinians, but they have not allowed anyone in to evaluate what actually happened there. And so this sparked these violent attacks. Um, you can see here, this is a home that was set on fire. Two Palestinians, according to Al Jazeera and other reporters on the ground, were killed in that rampage um, and many more who were injured as a result of the violence. We do have a State Department uh, statement from Matthew Miller. Let's put this up on the screen. So they say, we condemn the killings of 14-year-old Israeli Benjamin Ikemeyer and two Palestinians, uh, a 25-year-old Jihad Abu Aliya and 17-year-old Omar Ak Ahmad Abdul Ghani Hamad in the West Bank in recent days. This violence must stop and civilians must be protected. So very sort of uh, both sides mm -hmm. condemnation here from the State Department and very anesthetic language. Can put this next piece up on the screen, just a little bit of background on how consistently we've seen these violent attacks from settlers on Palestinians in the West Bank. This is from 972 Magazine from a, a while ago, back when Biden initially levied these sanctions against four settlers, and then some of those sanctions were rolled back. But in any case, they say meet the settlers targeted by Biden sanctions and their victims. Palestinians and Israelis who have experienced the settlers' attacks firsthand see the move as positive but wholly insufficient step toward accountability. And um, one of the things to really understand here is number one, that this settler violence and you know uh, widespread attacks on Palestinians in the West Bank, this has been on the rise for years, that they were very much emboldened by the Netanyahu government and especially some of the coalition partners who you know are settlers themselves and are uh, very encouraging and directly inciting of this violence. Uh, but if we're being honest, I mean, it has been official government policy to basically back this encroachment onto Palestinian land and violence against Palestinians for years, which is why many of these attacks, when we showed you the video where you've got Israeli soldiers just standing by while a car is being set on fire, um, the reason why, one of the reasons why the response on October 7th was so poor is because IDF soldiers had been restationed to be in and near the West Bank rather than near the Gaza Strip, leaving that part of Israel completely unprotected because they wanted to be there to back up these violent settlers. So, you know, the, the other piece of this is there's a lot of desire to pretend like history started on October 7th, but the reality is in the months leading up to October 7th, you had an escalation in violence. You already had one of the most violent years on record when it comes to Palestinians. And since October 7th, you have had an even larger escalation in terms of the number of attacks. So armed settlers and the Israeli army have killed 460 Palestinians in the occupied West Bank since October 7th and uprooted hundreds of people from their land. So this, the latest pogrom, which the, the other thing to say about this saga is even in the worst instances, so there was a horrific pogrom in Hawara, um, you'll recall one of the uh, Netanyahu coalition partners said it should be wiped off the map. You had um, a huge attacks and uh, many injuries and uh, killed as well. Zero accountability. No one was even, no one was indicted. No one was found guilty. Nothing happened. So they operate with impunity because they know they can not only get away with it, but that they're actually backed by the Israeli government. Yeah, there's been hundreds of attacks, uh, hundreds of killed, actually, that have been killed since October 7th. It's been the biggest spike in settler violence, actually, um, in, basically in modern times. And part of the issue uh, with all of this is that this is separate from what's happening in Gaza, but it 
underscores the settler activity and its endorsement by the government, the lawlessness, and it also is a blind spot for U.S. policy because for years, and even now, there are currently sanctions that are on people who have been instigating part of this settler violence at the same time that it is uh, in opposition to official U.S. policy and it is something that is just demonstrating you know, very clearly whether the Israeli government is advocating you know, for this settlement, bolstering, providing weapons, and then allowing this to occur. Even the Israeli center left is actually condemning a lot of the settler violence and settler riots because they, I mean, this has been a long time contentious issue about what exactly is our end state and purpose. And a huge part of this, backing these people, is a big part of Netanyahu's coalition and part of the reason he can't do anything about it. Yeah, I mean, Smotrich said of Hawara, we need to wipe it off the map. Yeah, there you go. It needs to right. be wiped out. Um, there was uh, one civilian who was killed there and 100 other Palestinians who were injured for critically, and as I said, zero accountability. You know, you have the Biden administration coming out, oh, we're going to we're gonna sanction four settlers, um, which is, you know, pathetic in the context of, number one, how widespread this, um, you know, this violence is, mm -hmm. how frequent the attacks are, and number two— it really sort of pretends like, oh, there's just these one-off bad apples. When you've got IDF soldiers standing by, you have a system of impunity and zero accountability for this violence, for the theft, for the assaults, for the fires that are set, and no criminal punishment for that whatsoever. So it's clearly a government policy. And there's zero acknowledgement of that from the Biden administration. But to your point, it is really of a piece with what is happening in Gaza. And, you know, the, the other part of this, let's put this up on the screen, to the point of the official government policy. We covered this previously. Remember, Israel just announced the largest West Bank land grab since Oslo. And it happened while our own Secretary of State, Tony Blinken, was there in the region. So, you know, the, the policy of pushing Palestinians off of their land um, it's been sort of a slow motion ethnic cleansing for years and years and years. And basically, October 7th gave this Israeli government an excuse to accelerate it. So that's why these things are connected. And remember, the West Bank, I mean, they had nothing to do with October 7th. And yet you've seen huge escalation in violence, hundreds of Palestinians who have been killed and, you know, in these attacks from settlers and also in attacks directly from the IDF. So we didn't want to lose sight of that. Uh, another major development here is apparently there were some rumors in Gaza that uh, Palestinians could return to the north. Remember, uh, Gaza City, of course, was previously the densest city in the entire um, Gaza Strip. So you had over a million people who were displaced from northern Gaza. Many of them are now in Rafah after being, you know, also chased out of Khan Yunus. And so there were rumors that, oh, we may be able to get back north, especially with the IDF withdrawing some of their forces. Let's take a listen to a news report from Al Jazeera's Hind al Qadri about Palestinians trying to return to the north. A couple of meters away from Wadi Gaza, the area that separates the north of Gaza with the south of Gaza, earlier today in the morning, a couple of families had the opportunity to go back to the north. It was a very surprising. People started coming from all parts of the southern areas to this area where they're saying that they want to go back to the north. As you see, people are holding their bags, uh, are holding uh, uh, all of what they own and have, and they are walking to the checkpoint, hoping they could cross back to the north. But on the other hand, people know that in the north, there is starvation, there's famine, they won't find food. Uh, they know that the situation in the northern Gaza Strip is very dire and it's unlivable, but they still want to go back to their houses. They want to check up on their beloved ones. Most of these families have their beloved ones still trapped under the rubble. They want to go and see their families, see their houses, if they're still standing or not. We have been talking to more 
than one family and they said that they do not have anything to lose and all they want right now is to go back to their houses. We don't want to stay in Rafa. We want to go back to our home. There is nothing to do in Rafa. We're looking for peace. Enough. Enough of the situation. Look. People are running to go back. We will only get sick here if we stay. The ability to, for Palestinians to return to northern Gaza has also been a key demand of Hamas in the ongoing ceasefire negotiations. And, of course, people very fearful that they may na- never be able to al- allowed to return home. Um, and, of course, we know there isn't a lot to return to at this point in northern Gaza, given the level of destruction, but people still desperate to try to make it back north and see what remains of their life and of their possessions. Unfortunately, however, as um, these individuals were seeking to return to their homes, and we can put this up on the screen, um, they were fired upon by Israeli forces. Um, you can see this video. This is from uh, Middle East Monitor and people are fleeing. You can see people, um, you know, uh, uh, ducking and covering. You can hear some of the audio, the gunfire and people running here along the beach. Um, We can go ahead and go to the next element, guys. We've got a New York Times report indicating that, um, you know, according to an emergency worker and two people who were attempting to make the journey, Israeli troops shot into this crowd. Uh, 23 were wounded by Israeli gunfire and five people were killed. So as these individuals were trying to return home, fired on by the IDF and a number of them killed and uh, dozens of them injured, you know, and they say in this report, nearly two million Gazans have been displaced by the war between Hamas and Israel. Now in its sixth month, one of their biggest concerns is when and if they will be allowed to return to their homes or whether they will be permanently displaced as previous generations were. Um, The IDF has since announced on social media that they are officially not allowing the return of residents, quote, for your safety, do not approach the forces operating there. Yeah, this is really, uh, really stunning because what we learn throughout all of this is that a lot of the things that they have said and that they have promised really just not materialized in terms of aid, in terms of what future governance in there all looks like, the chaos vacuum inside of it. And actually, before the Iranian attack, this was getting quite a bit of attention, both inside Israel and throughout the international community. Mm-hmm. I even saw that Israeli journalist Barak Rabi talking about the West Bank pogroms and about how devastating that was for the international situation. The Iranian uh, question has kind of moved on past But part of the reason we're spending time here, obviously, is because it's very significant to what the overall picture is going to look like, both in terms of whatever future that there is in Gaza and also what the how the Israeli government is going to manage both of the Palestinian territories. Yeah. And this is, you know, another thing that the U.S. has claimed to care about people Mm -hmm. being able to return to their homes. According to the IDF, operations have ended in northern Gaza. So. Yeah, what's happening? Right. What's the holdup? Exactly. What, what's next? And don't you want people, like you said you're going to invade Rafa, so don't you want people to get out of Rafa? Which one is it? Exactly yeah. right. Yeah, so. Exactly right. Uh, we, will learn the la- we will learn the answers to some of those questions very soon. Hey, guys, if you like that video, go to breakingpoints.com, become a premium subscriber, and help us build the best independent media organization on the planet. That's right. We're subscriber-funded. We're building something new. We want to replace these failing mainstream media organizations. So, again, to subscribe, it's breakingpoints.com.